with that, let us prepare our hearts, minds, and bodies to come into an encounter with God in the events of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit through the proclamation of Christ in word and song in communion. Blessed be God, creator, redeemer, and reconciler. And blessed be God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Savior Jesus Christ as the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us be seated and prepare for the readings. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for... Oh, that's not it. Sorry. Here we go. I got it. <laughs> Let's try that again. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. But you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before. And lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. For you yourself created my innermost parts. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. My body was not hidden from you. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God. If I were to count them, there, they would be more in number than the sand.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? <clears throat> Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus, when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise 
Please pray with me. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Amen. You can be seated. I came in this morning and all the music stands were over there. And my music stand was gone. And they were, it was over there. I didn't know which one it was, so I grabbed one. But I don't know if you noticed, but I can pull the top right off of this one. <laughs> so I went to adjust it, but it's anchored down here and the whole top just came up. Anyway, last week we were brought into the presence of a very big event initiated by a divine word. Let there be light. At this command, the universe was thrust into the divine light of order and basked in the magnificence of divine approval. It is good. The divine word pulled the lightness from the darkness and set the earth into its fluctuation between day and night, forever dancing and never crossing, one bowing to the other as it seeds the center stage to the other. This week, our attention turns to something much smaller, but no less magnificent, our own bodies. We, inside and out, are cosmic miracles, bipedal universes, worlds thrust and caught between illumination and obscurity. We are beautiful creatures composed of paradox. In fact, in that paradox, reflecting the paradoxical nature of our creator, we are soft and we are firm. We are rational and irrational. We are strict and lenient. We are happy and sad. We are exciting and boring. We know who we are, and we have yet to be introduced to ourselves, right? We are marvels and rather unexceptional. We crave inclusion and then seclusion. We want love, but not that much. We also want approval, but again, not that much. We are complex and simple. You're amazing. Whether you feel it or not, you're amazing. Fearfully and wonderfully made, value at a great price. You are worthy in your skin just as you are to be loved, just as you are. Just as you are, you don't need to change to earn love or worth or dignity. You have it into the very marrow of your DNA. I know I'm mixing my like my physical metaphors there, the marrow of the DNA, the marrows on the bone. I know. But to the very core of your DNA, you are worthy. You are you have dignity. You have honor. Okay? You are so amazing, but yet caution must be employed with ourselves, with our bodies, with our minds. While we are amazing, and I'll never back down from saying that, we are very vulnerable creatures. 
We are prone to being misled, lied to, fooled, lured, carried away by fear, threat, and intimidation, pulled into a sea of billows and waves of charlatans and con artists selling cures and liquid mythologies only to take proceeds from eager believers while leaving nothing but saccharine syrup. Most of all, we can be swept away by our own notions of our freedom and liberation, becoming drunk on autonomy, run amok. This is why Paul says, all things are permitted to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are permitted to me, but I, I will not be ruled by them. Food is for digestion and digestion is for food and God will abolish both one and the other. Now, the body is not for idolatry, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body and God and God both raised the Lord and will raise us up according to the power of God. Have you not yet known that our bodies are members of Christ? Okay, that's 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 12 to 15 a. Okay, that means the first chunk of the sentence that hits the first punctuation mark. You ever seen that? And sometimes the lectionary will be like, just read until B. What does that mean? That's the second major punctuation mark in the sentence. Huh. See, you're always learning something. You're always learning something. Okay, so while the historicity of, the Christ of Christianity has proven itself very capable at absolutely destroying bodily alterity and autonomy, I must call attention to the fact that this isn't Paul's fault. Okay, this isn't Paul. Paul comes from an era where you wouldn't have necessarily separated the soul from the body. It's one. You wouldn't, you, we get into the Greek, you have sarx and you have soma body and flesh. Sarx is sort of that flesh, right? And Paul will play with this like the sin of the flesh and the sin of the body, right? But never one was, was the body bad. That comes with the enlightenment. Yay, modernity. That's when you have the separation of the two. And that's like 1600s. That's when it kind of starts. Even Luther, even Luther never talks about a separation of the body in the Reformation. They didn't have that understanding. It was all one person, okay? So Paul never degrades the body to uplift the spirit. He's always talking about the one whole person. In part, sure, inner, outer. We Remember, we have inner thoughts and we have outer thoughts, but Paul keeps it all whole, okay? So when we look at Christianity, we have to take some ownership over the violence done to bodies, ripping them apart, defining them, making the soul more valuable than the flesh. Okay, so this is what I'm saying is that if you want to blame someone, don't blame Paul. Blame Paul's interpreters. <laughs> okay. Corinthians is one of my favorite collections of letters because of how well both the body and the self are held in high regard. Not only the body of the individual, but also the body corporate. And there's a lot of interplay going on here. Don't you know that you are members? The word can be translated limbs of the body of Christ, right? Okay, so the whole thing, the individual body and the corporate body are being held and they're always in dialogue, all right? So let's look more at this. So Paul begins by quoting some colloquialisms that came to him, most likely from Corinth. Did you notice on the slides there were quotations? Okay, all things are permitted to me. That is a quotation and it's repeated twice. So Paul gets a letter. Did you know there's four letters to Corinth? We only have two and four. One and three are missing. We don't have any of the letters that were sent to Corinth, okay? Scholars believe that all things are permitted to me is a colloquialism that Paul is responding to and then saying, but not all things are helpful, right? Okay, so all things are permitted to me. Corinthians are, all things are permitted. I am free in Christ. I can do whatever I want. And Paul says, meh. <laughs> okay. And then the next quote is, food is for digestion and digestion is food. I know your slide said stomach, but according to the translation and the scholars, blah, 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 it's the whole digestive system. Okay. So food is for digestion and digestion is for food. So I can eat whatever I want. I don't know if you know Corinthians well enough, but do you know, do you remember that there's an actual discussion on the eating of meat that has been sacrificed to idols? Okay, 
right? So digestion. You can eat. I can eat whatever I want. I'm free in Christ. Paul. Meh. Okay? So this is what Paul's doing is he's responding to things that are being written to him. Okay? And so he's responding to these things. Okay, so Paul jumps in contending directly with what he's heard and challenges it based on hindering and helpful terminology with a good dose of freedom from and freedom for. Do you know that helpful hindering terminology? If you're familiar with current trends in therapy, family systems therapy is something that plays off of this helpful and hindering rather than bad and good. Okay, so if you strip back that binary, this is a bad action, this is a good action, you can start to see that even our coping mechanisms can be helpful until they become hindering. And then once it becomes hindering to you and you're living in the world and you're living in relation with other people, then it's time to take stock and maybe pull back from that action, okay? Anyway, that helpful and hindering is really deeply in here with Paul, okay? So for Paul, the Christian has real and total liberty in Christ, okay? It is true. You can do a lot of things, okay? But to let that go unfettered as if you are just an isolated monad floating through the universe and the cosmos, okay, is ultimately going to come into contact, is going to become hindering because you're going to hit who or whom, sorry, the neighbor, someone else, right? You're actually not an isolated monad. So... You can only go so far with that idea of total liberty. I can do whatever I want. So while many actions can be helpful, they are so only until they become hindering to both the one doing the action or the neighbor. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? In other words, both individuality and community matters. Neither is to be victor over the other. It's not all for the community, and it's not all for the individual. You're going to be surprised. It's a paradox. Okay? It's both. Now, I know we're raised to think that we're the masters of our of not only our own domains, but also over destinies. But the reality is we're actually not. As mentioned last week, there is much we can plan and much that will happen this year that falls very wide of any plan we ever made. Right? The old evangelical saying, God laughs, you make a plan, and that makes God laugh. Right? God's going to bring certain things. Okay? So while I have a robust amount of freedom, I must always be aware that I'm not in this alone and that my freedom can end up being someone else's captivity. Okay? I don't know if any of you were ever in the school of theological thought of this total liberty and freedom in Christ. Okay? Have you ever embraced that? There was a big trend sort of like in the, um, in the tens. I know we just kind of left them, but like in the tens, theologically, there was this like liberty of the gospel, and I am free to be whoever and whatever I want, and I can do whatever I want, and I have a good relationship with God. And it was a trend in sort of like Protestant, Luther-inspired Christianity in, this, in the States, okay? But the problem is that if I'm free not to do something and I just decide not to do something, which is, you could, you could just own that, I might, if Chris is the next in command, it might force Chris now, but boom, what does she have to do? She now has to step up and do more, right? So my liberty to shirk my responsibilities might make Chris's life way more stuck in captivity, okay? I actually had experience of this where someone would claim their freedom and their Christian liberty and then jump things into my lap to which I was like, well, but so your freedom is my captivity. I now have to pick up these pieces. I now have to figure these things out because you can't handle it, right? So we have to interplay this freedom is freedom until it becomes someone else's captivity. All right, and that's what Paul's going on here. For Paul, Christians are expected to walk and talk differently, for they've been liberated from themselves to be captive to their neighbor, and all of it by faith in Christ working out in loving action. To say it doctrinally, we are to live resurrection lives now. Okay, and that means living into the divinely gifted glory of our beautiful bodies in alignment, inner and outer, and in unity with other humans, and especially with God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? 
okay? A resurrected life is a life that is upright, okay? Do you remember when we were talking about Romans and I talked a lot about the curved in nature of the human being who's like missing the mark, focused on themselves, all about themselves, and you curve in, you contemplate your navel. Have you heard that phrase before, right? Think about it. If you're going to contemplate your navel, you're actually going to curve in, okay? So in Romans, Paul does this thing where he's trying to upright, uncurl the Christian. That you are justified by faith. This is good and clear. Now go love. Remember the hand motion? The universal sign of I'm justified by faith, so I love my neighbor, right? Okay? This is the same thing is going on here, okay? Paul wants us to take our liberty, but be aware of the human beings around us. You don't go from curved in like this, contemplating yourself, to contemplating God, and then walk around contemplating God like this, right? You would fall over. Did you notice how many tiny steps I was taking? Because I was scared of falling over, right? You actually come face forward, and now you can see your neighbor, and then meet your neighbor where they are, and manage yourself in relation to the neighbor, so as not to make them stuck in captivity. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Awesome. You are all scholars now. All right? So this is why Paul spends time talking about uniting our bodies to idolatry. You notice I'm changing that word. People who like to translate the Bible and do Bible commentaries often love talking about certain things that human beings do. Okay. This word, porneia, that's the Greek, that gets translated as fornication, can also be idolatry. Now, if I consider the trend of Corinthians at large, both books, Paul's a little bit concerned about idolatry. Remember the comment about meat being sacrificed to idols? Okay, so I'm using the word idolatry in my translation to broaden that concept to get your minds out of the gutter. Okay, this is bigger than just physical intimacy. This is whole person intimacy with the world of the people. Okay, and where you're yoked, that matters. So this is why Paul spends time talking about our bodies being yoked to idolatry. Should we in our liberty just unite our bodies to anything, even things of idolatry, because we are justified by faith in Christ with God by the power of the Holy Spirit? Paul says, never is the translation. But guess what it is? Our old friend, Meganoito from Romans. Do you remember how much I love saying that word? Because it's a swear. Okay, meganoito in Greek is actually very offensive, okay? No, may it not be so. The reason, why does Paul say meganoito? Because essentially you are not your own, as you may like to think. You can't just do what you want, okay? Then after exhorting the Corinthians to flee idolatry, run from it, don't think twice about it, in verse 18, Paul says, have you not known that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God, okay? This is the thing about treasures and jars of clay, which also comes up in the Corinthian letters, okay? Treasures and jars of clay. We are jars of clay. The treasure is the Holy Spirit. God not only transcended God's self in the nativity to be born in Jesus, okay? God transcended God's self in Jesus and the Holy Spirit by Pentecost, and descending into human beings. You have the Spirit of God in you, by faith in Christ, in union with God. Isn't that neat? So you are this temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? You are not your own, Paul says. You were purchased with honor, Paul says. Now, glorify God in your body. This isn't about being pure and ritualistic and literal in regards to God's commands or conceptions of society or whatever it is. It's about being so free in your faith in Christ that you can love other people well where they are. You can even love them so well that at times you won't do what you want to do because it might hurt someone else. Okay? As a mom, that's like rule one. I didn't want to go through 30 hours of labor 
to bring forth, but my body said, oh, you're going to, and I had to put myself aside, right? And then from there on out, over and over and over again, this is what parents do repeatedly, okay? This is what Paul's asking the Corinthians to do. But what has this to do with hindering and helping, freedom from and freedom for? Well, it comes down to making absolutes and maxims about individual freedom and liberty that conflict with the liberty and freedom of the neighbor. According to Paul, that I am a Christian united to Christ by faith in union with God, filled with divine spirit and love, means I must take into consideration always my community, my neighbor, the other humans, to quote all dogs, living here with me whether the ones produced by my own body, whom I know intimately, or the ones I've never encountered with my body and whose names I may never know. That is the yoke. I must be aware of everyone outside of me, okay? I am not an island, in other words. I am not my own. I am now, according to Paul, yoked to Christ and the Spirit, burdened with the light yoke of just loving other people as they are where they are. That's it. That's the secret. It is not for me to conform others to my ideological orientations or force neighbors to get in line with my program. That's a lot of work, by the way, and very exhausting. If you tried to control people, it doesn't end well. No, I don't know anywhere in history where controlling people ruthlessly has ever ended well, right? Rather, I'm to serve my neighbor by my faith in Christ, working itself out in love to the well-being of my neighbor. I am to see my actions as not only helping or hindering me, but also whether or not they might be helping or hindering my neighbors, both near and far, for their well-being is linked to my own. Knowing that in doing this, I too will benefit as my neighbor thrives in abundance that is also mine. When your neighbor is free, guess what that means? You're free. Okay? So, in conclusion, very short paragraph. Don't worry, we're ending it up. Beloved, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay? Your body is amazing. It is so amazing that our sacred text exhorts you to care for it, treat it well, to honor it, and use it to bring glory to God because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. What you do to and with your body is important. It matters. Our actions towards ourselves should emphasize that divine gift of love, life, and liberation gifted to us by God through Christ and the Spirit. Rest when you're tired. Eat when you're hungry. Don't pretend like you don't have a body. That's not honoring it. Self-care. Go to the spa. Get the hair done. Find a pedicure. Get a mani, right? Do those things, whatever brings you life. But never forget that this exhortation extends beyond only what you do with your body and moves toward the neighbor. Taking their body into account, valuing it, considering it worthy, honoring it, making sure to hold it in regard because their body matters too. Let us remember these ones are also the beloved of God, purchased with honor by Christ's own body and temples of the Holy Spirit, loved by God, the same God who, who, who first loved us as we are and where we are. This whole entire sermon, TLDR, for our social media people, TLDR, too long, didn't read, right? Right? You could sum it up with this quote from 1 John 4.19. Beloved, let us love because God in Christ loved us first. And you're all thinking, well, why didn't you just say that? We'd be having coffee by now. So in whatever posture your body finds most comfortable, please join with me if you feel so called in the words of the affirmation of faith located on the screens in front of you. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of all living things. We believe in God beside us, 
Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit burning with Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. Again, in whatever posture you find most comfortable, and if you feel so called, please join with us in the prayers of the people. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for our community, the church, and the world. Creator, we pray for unity within the church of God and between all traditions. Grant that all who know you by any name may truly and humbly serve you and their neighbor. We pray for all bishops, priests, deacons, and leaders in all traditions. We pray especially for our leadership team here at Nativity. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in all the communities, states, regions, and nations of the world. Give each of us gathered here grace, strength, and courage to be examples of your love in all that we do. May our care for this world, our island home, show the gratitude and respect given by welcome guests. Have compassion on your people who are suffering from grief or troubles. Give to our beloved departed, especially Evelyn Kyle, eternal rest. Let us pray out loud or in silence for our own needs and for those of others. Grant us these blessings, O Lord. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God, our neighbor, and creation. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Greet each other in acceptable forms of peace.
And you can be seated while we do blessings of birthdays and anniversaries. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Oh, you're sneaky. <laughs> Yay! Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so remember, prayer book, choose your own adventure, ecclesiastically. Um, we're going to go to page 830. 830. Do you have a preference? All right. Let's do, I think last week we did number 51, so we'll do number 50. And it's Judy, and you use she, her pronouns. Okay, well, we'll, are you okay if I use she, her pronoun? Okay, great. (laughs) Are you also okay if I put my hand on your shoulder? Wonderful. So whoever would like to join with me, number 50, and it's Judy, she, her, okay? Oh, God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant, Judy, as she begins another year. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessings. And may you have a robust another year. Anyone else? Oh, oh no. Returning a book. Returning a book. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead to the offertory sentence. This is the moment where um, priests and bank robbers sound exactly alike. (laughs) Hands up. Give me all your money. (laughs) Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
things come of you, O God. This is God's table for God's people. Everyone who feels called to come forward to partake is not only invited, but deeply encouraged to do so. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O God, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your spirit, your Holy Spirit, upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ, and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son and his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Evelyn Kyle and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, 
now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hagia tois hagiois, holy gifts for holy people. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Eternal God, heavenly creator, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved, God bless you and keep you. God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the creator, the reconciler, and the redeemer be among you and remain with you always. As those who have been encountered by God in the event of faith, in the proclamation of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, go. Go forth into the world, carrying and sharing the grace and mercy of God, bringing God's love to all. Alleluia, alleluia.